Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? This is a program where we are fantastically, uh, I can't use a big enough word here, interested in the Bible, the Word of God, because it is God's Word. It, we, we should really be fascinated. We should really be, be uh, uh, marveling constantly at the fact that Almighty God has put into our hands a book that has been written by Him. Yes, uh, it's true. He used human scribes, holy men of old, spoke as God the Holy Spirit moved them. But every word, every letter of every word, every sentence, every phrase came right from the mouth of God. And therefore, we don't dare touch the original languages. Oh, yes, our translation, we can question here or there that it, uh, did the translators do as good a job as they could have done. And once in a great while, particularly if we have a fine translation like the King James translation, we will find uh, a, a word that should have been translated, uh, could be translated a little better another way, but it'll be fairly rare. On the other hand, there are many translations around where uh, they have left out verses or they have questioned uh, the authority of these verses and so on and so that they have really made a shambles of the Bible but this is your program we want to hear from you and shall we take our first call tonight please good evening welcome to open forum hey mr. camping how you doing very well thank you this is uh, Tim Clayton from Easton Maryland uh, I've got two questions tonight for you the first uh, question comes out of uh, Ze Zechariah chapter 8, uh, 20, verse 20 through 23. Let's look at that. Zechariah. Zechariah. Chapter 8. There we, <coughs> there we read. Zechariah chapter 8, verse, uh, what were the verses? 20, I'm sorry, what were the verses you had? 20 to 23? Oh my, right, we've lost our caller. We've, uh, I'm sorry, we can't follow through on this. Uh, 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 let's go to our next caller, I'm sorry. Good evening, welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Yes. Um, I have a question about um, if you're a Christian, whether you can um, uh, pursue a lawsuit. Well, the, the problem or the fact is, yes, God does give us the government to rule over us and to maintain uh, peace between the citizens and and so on, and so it is possible to uh, to sue someone if they have uh, have uh, done something bad to you. However, there's another side to this that we have to think about, and that it is is that even though we may think it's my right to sue, is it a wise thing to sue? Uh, you know, to sue means that you are going to be. Uh, 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 very depressed you're going to be very busy thinking about this you're thinking bad things against the other people and it's very hard to do this in a way that you are uh, you are really living to God's glory and uh, oftentimes it's far better just to say well okay they have reviled me they've taken advantage of me they've harmed me but uh, and maybe I have a right to sue, but I don't have to press that right. I'm not under any ob obligation to sue, and I can really live more faithfully and happily as a child of God if I do not sue. And that's the kind of a, a, a question that has to be raised 
when you uh, are thinking about suing? Uh, yeah, it's a problem that has been ongoing, and uh, actually, I have done what you said. You know, tried to let it go and pray, and but it's really a problem that's actually affecting other people as well. So. Um, well, I'm sorry, I I cannot yeah. make it be a judge yeah. in a case like this. This is something you pray for wisdom. Right. Now, bear in mind a fundamental rule. Whatever we do, do all to the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Right. And think about it. Now, if you press this suit, uh, is that really going to somehow glorify God? And so uh, it, uh, it makes it a very, very difficult decision. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, uh, you do know that as you suffer for, uh, for wrongdoing, that 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 is because somebody is doing you something something wrong to you that is not at all in uh, uh, contrary to God, uh, Christians expectation in this world right i understand that and i have suffered greatly and severely and, and but but it, like you said i'm i'm still going to pray about it but even you know and i don't care about money but it's something that i think has to be done and the money i would take i would donate it to you know, well, family radio and you know other well, things like that yeah well the fact there's another problem also and that is there are, there are, it's very conventional today you know to see an opportunity to make money and if you're suing in order to gain money no 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 so, no. i'm doing i really don't want to do it it's been well excuse yeah, me yeah. you indicated there would be money forthcoming if you win the suit and uh, and so uh, why is there money forthcoming in other words uh, uh if you're suing just to rectify a wrong uh, does it involve money or does it involve anything beyond what the what the actual harm is but uh, today you know lawsuits uh there's personal injury there's there's uh, uh defamation of character there's all kinds of things that uh we try to put a money val money value to and frankly uh, it's uh, it's a it's a way that uh, a number of people really try to uh get into uh, big money uh with and so uh that that money aspect of it is what what makes it far more interesting to sue and you got to be careful if that's why that that, that is not uh, really dominating the scene more than you think but you have to pray for wisdom and thank you for calling and sharing and uh, shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum good evening uh brother camping yes how are you tonight very well thank you Thank you for taking my call. I'd like to, if you can make a comment on uh, Jeremiah 16. Jeremiah. This, this, the whole uh, chapter talking about the uh, church age. Yeah, in Jeremiah 16. Let me turn to that a minute. In Jeremiah 16. Uh, there we read, uh, uh, and any verses particularly that you're concerned about, he, he's really talking about his judgment upon uh, those who are are in the local congregations because they have not been faithful. Uh, right, right. That's what I thought. That um, he's talking the, the also. I think in the same chapter is talking about uh, when uh, people uh, see that you know what's going on in the church, but they don't want to leave and they want to go back there and try to tell the people to to get out or something like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, as we go through chapter after chapter of Jeremiah, one thing we do know. And I've checked this out very, very carefully, is that while God is using as an example of what he's teaching concerning our day, he used it as an example what happened to ancient Judah 
uh, when they were destroyed by the Babylonians in 587 B.C. Uh, and Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed. But actually, that was simply an illustration, uh, uh, and it was pointing uh, more uh, insistently at our day when God has been finished with the local congregations who were typified by ancient Jerusalem and the temple and so on. And uh, it, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of ugly language there, and uh, we should take it very, very seriously. You know, I was, uh, if, if we read the whole chapter 16, and uh, we really carefully meditate on every verse, we can find that, uh, you know, it's like your eyes are open to see what's going on in the churches today. Uh, well, yes, that is true. I, I, uh, because, of course, the Bible is uh, always prophesies truth. Uh, but then as we see this happening, we have to ask ourselves, well, then what about me? Am I being faithful? It's bad enough that this, uh, this uh, uh, judgment is on the churches, but what about me and my life? Am I uh, uh, truly living a Christian walk? Have I come out of the church? Am I trying to be a faithful uh, a faithful uh, ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ in this world and uh, uh, what about my personal relationship with Christ and in the meanwhile I want to be praying for my loved ones and my friends and uh, those who are in the churches that somehow that somehow at least uh, uh, this one or that one might hear the truth from outside and come out but thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, Mr. Camping. How you doing? Very well, thank you. Uh, this is Tim Clayton. I'm calling from Eastern Maryland. Uh, I got two questions for you. Uh, the first one that comes out of Zechariah, Zechariah chapter eight, uh, verses twenty through twenty-three. Okay, that was what you were asking. Let me look at it again. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 20 to 23. There we read, um, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, It shall be yet come to pass that there shall come people, and the inhabitants of many cities, and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord, and to seek the Lord, our Jehovah of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek Jehovah of hosts in Jerusalem, and to pray before Jehovah. Thus saith Jehovah of hosts in those days, it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold uh, uh, but of all the all languages of the nations even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Now you see, this is really talking about our day when God is evangelizing the world, not from the vantage point of the local congregations, but from the fact that the gospel is going out into the world outside of the local congregations. God, at this time, when there is this judgment already had, that has come upon the churches as they're being prepared for their turn at the judgment throne, at the same time, there is an enormous harvest that God is developing and will be completed when we come to the very last day when Christ puts in his physical appearance, visible, he's visible to the whole world. And until that time, uh, there, God is saving a great number of people. And God uses very interesting language here as he's saying ten men. Now ten is the, is a symbol or a a signifying complete, the completeness of all those who God intends to save will take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew. And who is that? The Lord Jesus Christ. We will go with you for we have heard that God is with you. In other words, there will be 
as we read in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, a great multitude, which no man can number, that will be turning to Christ. And that is happening in our day and will uh, probably become uh, a greater and greater crescendo of harvest, uh, a great uh, increase in harvest as we approach the last day. Okay, my second question comes out of Luke. Uh, chapter 9, verses 16 and 17. Luke 9, verse 16 and 17. Let's look at that. Luke 9, verse 16 and 17. Uh, and here we see that Christ is going to show that he is the bread of life. There are many, many people out there in the wilderness that listening to him teach, and, there, and now it's time to, uh, for physical food. And so, uh, in fact, there were about 5,000 men, and then besides that, there obviously were men, women and children. And so there were a great many people. And he said to his disciples, make them sit down by fifties in a company, and they did so and made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them and break and gave to the disciples to set before the multitude. And they did eat and were all filled, and they, there was taken up of fragments that remained to them twelve baskets. Now, what is your question? Okay, where it says, and there was taken up, of fragments that remain to them, twelve baskets. Is that, does that is that a picture that the that the that there is never an end to the gospel? That the gospel continues. I don't, I don't know if it's that kind of a figure. It certainly is a a picture of the fact that the gospel is sufficient to feed all that God intends to feed. Right. These five thousand men. The number five signifies. Uh, uh, in this context, salvation, the right. thousand, the complete salvation plan. Christ is the bread of life. He was typified by the bread. And and all those that God uh, uh, expects to save are going to be saved. It, there will not be a shortage of the mercy of God. God uh, and it will be very precise, as a matter of fact, because... Uh, because uh, uh, all those whom God came to save Christ had to make payment for each one's individual sins. Well, thanks, Mr. Campbell. Have a good evening. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. I have a question. It has to do with heaven. Um, now, when Lucifer, Satan... Um, uh, became and wanted to be better than God. And I'm wondering when a person dies and if they go to heaven and they become, can they become evil like Satan did and his, and their mind can change and then become against God in heaven? Now, now let's think about this for a moment. Lucifer is an, a, an angel, a fallen angel. They are spirit beings that were created by God at the beginning, like all the angels are spirit beings. Mankind is not created as an angel. They are created in the image of God, in the likeness of God, and no angels were not created in the likeness of God. So a human being will never, never become a devil or a fallen angel or a good angel. Uh, that's an entirely different kind of a, a personality that God has created. Secondly, when we go, uh, the only ones that will go to heaven are any, the only people that will go to heaven are those whose sins have been fully paid for and who have been given eternal life. They will never, never, never become evil. Uh, once we leave our bodies and go to be with Christ, uh, we are, uh, if we are a true believer, that will happen. We will never, never sin again. And when we receive our 
resurrected bodies on the last day, and all the true believers will, then as a whole personality, we will live with Christ in the new heaven and the new earth, and never, never again will we ever fall into a sin. I was just wondering about that. That's been on my mind for years and years. Well, thank you for calling and sharing, and I hope this answer will help thank you. Thank you. And shall thank we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. How are you? Yes, very well. Thank God you. God bless you this evening, and thank you so much for sharing. I have a question for you. Yes. Um, what do you do when you have family members who consistently hurt you what would the Lord have you do about something like that well you know when Christ was revived turn would you kindly turn your radio down we are sure. getting some feedback uh, the fact is that uh, Jesus uh, really spoke to that he says you uh, if we are a true believer we're going to be reviled we're going to be misunderstood we're going to be slandered and uh, the Bible speaks about turning the other cheek. The Bible says that when Christ was reviled, he reviled not again. In fact, the Bible says, and, and here's a, uh, this is a shocking statement when we first read it, but actually this is right from the mouth of God. God is saying in Matthew chapter 5, uh, Matthew chapter 5, he's saying there in verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, that's a blessing when we suffer because we're trying to do it God's will. Now, it is true, however, that uh, we may uh, have uh, people uh, say uh, nasty things or we think they're nasty things against us, and it may be that we haven't been so very nice. Maybe we deserve some of the criticism. And, and and there again, we're not to lash back. We're to really be thankful. You know, I needed that that criticism. I I, I don't always look at myself objectively, and and that there is a little area of my life there that I ought to straighten out a little bit more. And then you can be thankful for it. In other words, to make uh, to, to, when we're criticized and, and reviled unjustly, we can thank the Lord that we can uh, endure this kind of persecution. If we are criticized or reviled justly, we can thank the one uh, that is criticizing us uh, because we needed to be, be a little more encouraged to do it more quickly God's way. So we really never, never have an excuse to be upset when people are going after us, when they are uh, trying to hurt us in some way. We never have to be hurt by that. We never have to be uh, upset by that. We just have to think, well, I'm going to follow God's rules and then I won't be troubled by it. I understand what you're saying. Um, it, it, sure, it, it surely is true when it comes to criticism and stuff. But it seems like whenever you're out there trying to do the Lord's work, there's always someone there trying to stop you. You know, and it gets, it, it sometimes it's very, very difficult when you're out there constantly doing the, the Lord's work. Well, of course. That's what else can we expect? Does the world, do most people of the world want the Lord's work to be done? The answer is no, no. They don't want that. And so they will try to set up roadblocks at times and they will. A misunderstand and that's why God says blessed are they when they persecute uh, uh, we we read in verse 11 blessed are ye when men I'm reading Matthew 5 verse 11 thank you so much for sharing that verse with yeah. me. I have something to you know, to look forward to in the future because 
I now won't take it personally ever again after speaking with you. I will never, ever take it personally again when someone goes out of their way to persecute me or hurt me. Just for let him do it. For sticking up for what's right and sticking up for my, my, my dad, you know, who was taken out of his home and my mom passed away and my brother was power of attorney and took him out of his home and put him all the way in another state away from his, you know, children. And, you know, that wasn't my doing and, and it was very hurtful to me and, they're angry at me because I didn't agree with them. You know, I yeah, have six well, other but, siblings. But you see, the problem is we can go through life uh, with a thin skin or a thick skin. And thin skinned people, we, you know, that's a figure of speech we use that the minute somebody looks cross eyed at them or says some, makes some comment that they think is. Uh, 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 not kind or whatever they 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 react to this and they they lash back and and uh, so their life is always in turmoil on the other hand we can be more thick skinned to use a figure where we uh, where we hear those things and yet we don't hear them we don't pay attention we just consider the source they don't understand I only have to answer to God uh, they will not, uh, they may never be able to understand, so they may continue to revile me. So what? So what? I, I, I just want to make sure that what I am doing is pleasing to God. I don't have to, first of all, ask, is this pleasing to everybody around me? But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. Hi. Hello? Yes, go ahead with your call. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm calling from Staten Island. There was a lady yesterday that was questioning uh, the baptism about water. And the two verses that came to me was First Peter 3.21, where it says that water symbolizes baptism. And that uh, briefly, uh, that it's a form that the body... Uh, it's a pledge of good conscience towards God. And the well, second thing... Well, excuse sorry? me, excuse me. All right, this verse is used to somehow give credence, spiritual credence, to the physical action of water baptism. But that's because the people who are reading that this way do not have the right method of interpretation. Christ spoke in parables, and without a parable he did not speak. And here he is saying, Baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. What baptism saves us? The water baptism, or the water baptism puts away the filth of the flesh. But this is a baptism that saves us, not the, uh, that, that, that uh, cannot be water baptism. What baptism is that? That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit as he washes away our sins. And that is what gives us a good conscience toward God. But shall we? Hold on. I'll be right back with you. On the line who has brought our attention to First Peter chapter three verse twenty one, and uh, m uh, most people who read this immediately think of water baptism, and yet the verse itself is indicating no, it's not talking about water baptism. That is what uh, that is what takes away the filth of the flesh, but this is the baptism that saves us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, namely the fact that. Uh, because Christ arose, uh, he has has been. Uh, he has, it means that he has paid for the sins of those he plans to save, and therefore their sins have been washed away. That's spiritual baptism. The snare is that again and again uh, there are those who see the word baptism, and all they can think about is water baptism. But unless the Bible is uh, especially talking about water and, and saying that it's water baptism, we have to first of all ask the question, in all likelihood, this is uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's the washing away of our sins by Christ. 
Right, and, and, and that's why I think, first I thank you for the translation of First Peter, and that's why I also reference to Matthew 3.11. Can you read Matthew 3.11? All right, now Matthew 3, verse 11. Uh, there we read in Matthew 3, verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water. Now this is John the Baptist preaching. Uh, uh, he, is, uh, he is bringing... Uh, uh, preparing the people for the fact that Christ is about to show uh, show up, and uh, and he of course is the very essence of the kingdom of God, and he's saying, "I baptize you with water unto repentance," not meaning that you will uh, uh, you will become saved, but so that as you are washed with water and you recognize. That, uh, that you have to have your sins washed away, the first thing you will want to do is to begin to turn away from your sins. Now, when we read the rest of the Bible, we know we can turn away from our sins all day long, and that will not get us saved. There's nothing we can do to get saved, but, but uh, when we finally repent with all of our heart, and we'll only do that when Christ has actually saved us, then we can say uh, we have truly had our sins washed away because uh, uh, because uh, when we when we uh, repent with all our heart and with all our soul it means that god has given us a brand new soul a brand new spirit which is exactly uh, uh, emphasizing that we have become saved and therefore our sins are washed away. But then he goes on, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. In other words, he'll wash you. That's Christ who's coming. When he comes, he will wash you of your sins and, and uh, by fire that is he is in your place will go through the fires of hell uh, and that is what is required in order that we might become saved can i ask one more question yes okay thank you um i was having a conversation with with, with my brother and uh he mentioned that when 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 satan was in heaven uh is it true that God gave him authority over all the angels and also uh, in music? Are you talking about Satan? Yes. Absolutely not. That is tr that's not true at all. Okay. Uh, he does not have authority over any of the good angels. He happens to, there are quite a number of, of uh, angels that fell with him, rebelled with him, and he does have some authority over them. They're the fallen angels, but uh, uh, that's his, uh, and he has been given authority throughout the Old Testament period over uh, those who remain unsaved. And in our day, he's been given authority in the local congregations to rule. But these are all limited authorities that God has very carefully prescribed, has set up. Uh, in order to use Satan for his purposes. Okay, well, I thank you very much for your time and your translation. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Harold. Yes. This is your good caller, Brian, from Toms River, New Jersey. Uh, could you take a look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 15? Revelation 13, verse 15. Let's look at that. There we read. Then he had power to give unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, what is your question? Uh, now, now today in the churches, uh, let's say uh, someone is, I'm out of the church, but uh, let's say someone's in the church and they uh, maybe disagree with the uh, pastors and things like that, and they disagree about divorce and remarriage and all that. Is that what this is referring to? In a sense? Well, actually, it ties back into Revelation chapter 11, where it talks about the 
when God is finished with the local congregations, then uh, the true believers are killed. That is, they are silenced so that they can no longer share the true gospel in the local congregations. They are driven out. They are excommunicated. As a matter of fact, they're commanded by God to come out. And and uh, Satan uh, is very active in making in trying to get the true believers out. We find in Revelation 13, in verse 7, where God declares, and was it was given unto him. This is Satan as he rules in the congregations, unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kingdoms and tongues and nations. In other words, God has given Satan a lot of authority and a lot of power in our day because God is utilizing him as God's servant of all things. God uses that language as God's servant to uh, to prepare the ch- church and the world for ju- the, the uh, those people who remain unsaved for their time before the judgment throne. And he prepares them by assisting them in becoming more sinful than ever. That sin is really multiplying everywhere we turn. One more question. Could you look at Revelation chapter 14, verse 1? And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And when we uh, work this through the scriptures very carefully, comparing scripture with scripture, these 144,000 are a symbolical number. It's not an actual number in any sense of the word. The number 1,000 is completeness. The number 12 is fullness. And 12 times 12 is is super fullness, you could say. So you have the complete fullness of all those who would, whom God planned to save throughout the church age. They are typified by, as the 144,000, and they have their father's name. That is, they uh, are owned by God because they have truly become saved. And uh, and then it is after this 144,000, that is the complete fullness of all those whom God planned to save throughout the church age, uh, is finished. Uh, then God will also have a great multitude which no man can number that he speaks about in Revelation 7, verse 9, and to the end of the chapter. And they... Uh, will be saved afterwards outside of the churches. They are the ones who are being saved today as the true gospel goes out from uh, uh, areas outside of the church. Thank you for all your help, Brother Harold. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Thank you, Brother Camping. Um, I have a one question. Is anywhere in the Bible does God explain? I'm why? sorry, your voice is low. Would you turn? Or would you speak right into your phone, please? Sure. Is anywhere in the Bible does God explain why He's going to create a new earth at the why end of he's, the world? Why He's going to create the new earth? Yes. Well, yes. In Second Peter chapter three, there He says. Let me read from there. In Second Peter chapter three, we read uh, uh, there. As soon as I get to it, we read there. Uh, we're looking for this verse twelve. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of the God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. In other words, this present universe is destined to be destroyed because it has come under the curse of God. Nevertheless, we, it goes on, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. You see, God promised the believers, like for example in Matthew 5, the blessed are they 
uh, uh, who will uh, inherit the earth. Now, we will not inherit the earth in its present uh, uh, cursed situation where we have volcanoes and and uh, and earthquakes and and uh, poisonous snakes and so on. But it will be a it will out of as it were. God doesn't use quite this language, but is it as it's as it were out of the ashes of the old earth. God is going to create a new universe, and it'll be quite different from the present universe. Our present universe, which goes out uh, mi- uh, millions of light years out into space, uh, uh, is separated from heaven where Christ is. Christ is up there. We are down here. And But when God, God is finished with this present earth, he will destroy it and recreate it a new heaven and a new earth where there will not be a separation between heaven where Christ is and the earth where where the true believers will be living forevermore. It will all be one. So it will be a, an absolutely different kind of a creation, and we haven't the slightest idea of how that is all going to be. We have to wait upon God for that. But it's going to be something super glorious, that we know. Okay, uh, one more question, sir, if I could. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the world, when God... Um, Brings judgment down on the uh, non-believers. He's going to judge their works. Yeah. If our works don't mean anything, why will he judge our works? Well, the. In other words, the, if oh, our works oh, are not going to be saved, well, first why would he judge them? Well, first of all, when you say our works don't mean anything, you know, God commanded mankind to be obedient to Him. Uh, and obedience is doing good works. And the problem is, God said that if you disobey, that if some of your works or even one of your works is not not uh, completely obedient, then that is sin. And then you're going to be in terrible trouble because the law of God declares that there has to be a payment for sin. Uh, the same as our own system of jurisprudence calls for a, a a penalty if we break the law, and so it is with God's law. There is a penalty, and that penalty is horrible because sin is horrible. It's eternal damnation, and so any of our works cannot uh, cannot pay, uh, satisfy. Uh, the the uh, the penalty that has come upon us. We're all sinners. Every one of us, by nature, is a sinner, and we sin again and again and again. And even one sin would be sufficient to get us in this terrible trouble with God. And the only way we can get into God's grace, good graces again, into God's uh, heaven, in other words, is that we have to first go to hell forevermore and make payment for our sins. And of course that, if anyone who goes that way will never make it because hell is forevermore. And so Christ, God has provided a substitute, a stand-in for those that he planned to save, namely the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus made the full payment for our sins. And our works can't contribute anything because anything we do is tainted by sin. And besides that, even if we could live virtually perfectly, we'd still have some sin in the past that still has to be paid for. We'd still have to go to hell. So there's no way that our works can ever, ever count in the slightest degree toward getting right with God. Uh, we, uh, the, the, the problem is that whatever sin remains, and there always is sin, it has to be paid for, and the penalty is eternal damnation. We have to depend entirely upon Christ to do the whole work in getting us saved. And when he saves someone, he pays for every sin of that individual. So now that individual stands before God as if he has never committed a sin, and therefore God is able to save him. 
Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, sir. How are you doing tonight? Very well, thank you. Hey, I, I was reading um, Exodus 7, and I was reading the account of... Uh, of the Lord telling Moses to smite the river in Egypt to turn it to blood. And the interesting thing about that is that it almost seems like God goes out of his way to mention that not only was the river turned to blood, but the streams, the pools, the ponds, and any other wooden or stone vessel. And to me, it seems like that's a picture of the end of the church age, how every congregation would be under judgment, because blood is a picture of judgment, right? And the water, or the gospel, insofar as the church age is concerned, would be the place, would be the congregation. Well, that's, it, po that's possible that we might see that. I've never thought of it that way. I'd, I, would want to, I would want to consider that, and I'm not sure uh, that I could agree fully, but, but it certainly is a possible idea. It is a possible idea. And, and I, there that the, that the Egyptians were digging around the banks, tr desperately trying to find water, but there was no water. There was no gospel at all, yes, yeah. Uh, uh, the, uh, and, of course, it is God who has brought that judgment. Uh, the other side of the coin, however, we've got to be careful here now. God has... God is the one who turned the water into blood. God did not, did not cause the churches to sin. Sin comes out of the heart of man. God, man is in rebellion against God. But blood signifies God's wrath. And I think it would be safer to say that it might be a picture of God's wrath on all the churches where, where there is... Uh, where they are thinking that they have the gospel, and yet now that gospel has turned altogether into the wrath of God. It might, it, that is a possibility. So that um, at times Moses can be a type or a figure of Christ. And in, in, in Revelation, we know that Christ himself is the one that comes in judgment on the congregations. Well, he, he is the judge. He is the judge, but you see, it is God who turned the water into blood. It was not the Egyptians who, uh, who are the land of Egypt that turned the water into blood. It was God who did that, and it was a judgment upon them. And, it, and Egypt, it is true, just to further your idea a little bit farther, it is true that in the Bible does God, use, God does use Egypt in various places as a picture of the local congregations of our day that are under the judgment of God and uh, the fact that uh, that wherever they turned there was blood uh, could emphasize I think you're you're on the right track there could emphasize that wherever we turn every congregation is under the judgment of God. There are no exceptions. That we know from other parts of the Bible to be true. And thank you for that thought. And shall we take our next thought, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Okay, um, I have a question relating to a passage I was reading in uh, Matthew about... Um uh, when Peter was talking to Jesus, who do you say that I am? And he says, and then he says, upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. And I keep hearing the speaking about the end of the church age, and I'm just having trouble reconciling the two. Well, the problem is that, first of all, the rock upon which the church Christ is speaking about is not Peter. Peter is a Greek word that is, uh, except in one place, it's always translated Peter. And even in the place where it's translated stone, I think it should have been Peter. On the other hand, uh, Christ is the rock, and, and the word that is, uh, that Greek word is almost identical to the word Peter, but it is not the same word. And the rock upon which the church that Christ is talking about 
is the true or is the body of believers who those who have truly become saved now now the second thing is that when Christ says I will build my church he is not talking about the local congregations he's not talking about a denomination he is not talking about this external uh, organization that we call the churches he is talking about the eternal church that he is still building today that can never go out of existence and that consists only of those who are true believers whereas the local church can can have a few true believers in it but it can be shot through with all kinds of people who are not true believers and god gives us illustration of that for example in revelation 3 the church at sardis was already a dead church although it still had a few true believers within it and and the reason we know it's not talking about the local congregations it says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it now the gates of hell have to do with the judgment of god and and the only people who are not under the judgment of god are those who have truly become saved they are eternally secure from ever going to hell hell cannot have them on the other hand uh, the bible is very clear that there are all kinds of people in the churches who are not saved they appear to be saved they think they are saved they've been told they were saved and so on but they are not saved and the gates of hell still will claim them the gates of hell will uh, because if you're not saved, even though you're a faithful member of the congregation and you've been baptized in water and, and you've gone through all the rituals and so on, if you're not saved, you're still under the wrath of God. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. How you doing, brother? Uh, I was calling because I had a quick question. Um, you said that uh, the world or the revelation is supposed to start in 2011. Where do you find that exactly? How did I arrive at that? Yes, sir. Well, that uh, that actually is developed through a long period of time of careful studying of the Bible. And the first thing we must remember that we have learned from Ecclesiastes chapter 8 that to every purpose there is time and judgment or time and the law. Time is very, very important, the Bible teaches. And secondly, God teaches in Ecclesiastes 8 that the true believers, those who are spiritually called wise, will know time and judgment. Well, first of all, we find that in our generation, we're able to go through the Bible and lay out uh, the, uh, the whole history of the world very accurately from only from biblical information where we can find we can know that the bible gives us a calendar of history beginning with the first year 11,013 bc when creation occurred and and going through the time when the flood occurred at 4990 bc and all kinds of other time information that has never been available before but now God has opened our eyes to know this. And so, and as we study the time patterns of the past history, we find that the God, uh, as he unfolds his salvation plan, and that's really uh, what it's all in, uh, tied into, it is not done by whim or caprice. It is not done erratically. It is not done in a haphazard way but that it follows a very distinct pattern. And there's a, a, a very, very careful interrelationships that exist between various dates. Then as we project these dates into the end of the world, and, and there's a lot of information that help us do that, we find that uh, they focus on 2011 as the likely year. 
that Christ will come. For example, in Second Peter chapter 3, it says a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. And the fact is, the context there is speaking about the flood of Noah's day when there was the whole world was destroyed of that day in that day by water. And it's also speaking about the day when God is going to destroy this world by fire at the end of time. And and in that context, uh, God says very solemnly and seriously, uh, Beloved, there's one thing I want you to know. A day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. Well, we also uh, wonder, well, then what does the day have to do with these two periods of judgment? And we go back to, we, we don't see this uh, uh, in any way that we can uh, identify immediately with the judgment at the end. But when we look at the judgment on Noah, we find that he was told in Noah was told, in seven days I'm going to destroy this world. Get into the ark, all, you and all the animals, in seven days. Well, if a day is a thousand years, and if that, if that message to Noah uh, means that he, he, God is showing us that, that before Judgment Day, God is giving us a timeline, then we have to say, well, then maybe that day is a thousand years. In 7,000 years, there's going to be a judgment on the world. And lo and behold, when we have worked independently from other uh, resources in the Bible and arrived at the year 2011 as the likely year of the end, hold on, I'll be right back with you right after this message. We're talking about this interesting question, how can we know that, or how does the Bible show us that maybe 2011 is the last year? And I'm just citing one piece of evidence. Uh, when we go from 4990, the year, we know that quite accurately from the Bible information as the year when God destroyed the world in Noah's day, and go exactly 7,000 years, we come to the year 2011. Now, is that coincidental? Is that accidental? Maybe. I don't think so. We find that these, uh, that uh, God has, uh, in a very hidden, veiled way, uh, made reference to that as he's saying in Second Peter 3, Beloved, there's one thing I want you to know and that uh, that you're not to be ignorant of and that is that a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day and that puts the finger right on 2011 uh, as one reason one reason amongst many other reasons fact is we're in family radio we've prepared this book Time has an end. It's over 500 pages, very carefully going through the history of the world, seeing how God has given us an enormous amount of information concerning the timetable of history. And it's available free of charge to anyone who calls or asks for it. It'll be sent to you free and postpaid. No demands are made for a gift or anything. We want you to have it so that it will help to direct you into the Bible. We don't want you to trust that book. Never. We want you to trust the Bible. But this, we can, a uh, Bible teacher has the role of assisting us in getting into the Bible so that we can know uh, where to look uh, to gain certain information. But thank you for calling, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. Yes. Hi. Um, I just have a, a quick question for you. I am, uh, I've been listening to your show for a little while now, for the last year or so. I have yet to read the Bible. I'm kind of new to all this. But one thing I've noticed is that you say quite repeatedly that this is the Word of God. You, you, you reiterate that quite a bit. And I was just wondering what you have in the way of uh, what, what, what substantiates that. How do you... Uh, well, 
I, you know, you, you can't know that at all till you start reading the Word of God very, very carefully. And of course, the Bible itself it constantly speaks of itself as the Word of God. And as we go through the Bible, we find that there has been prophecy after prophecy. Uh, and, and in every case, uh, if the time has come to when that prophecy was predicted to, to take place in the Bible, it did take place. Uh, there's no other book like it written anywhere. It is, uh, for example, today, uh, all that we're talking about, the end of the church age and the timing of the end and all of this, was all prophesied in the Bible. And as we look out in the world, we see everything is happening in exact agreement with what the Bible predicted, because it is the Word of God. And uh, and only when we start reading the Bible as the Word of God will our spiritual eyes be open, or begin to be open so that we will understand this. Uh, for example, uh, God predicted that the nation of Israel would again become a viable nation among the nations of the world. And... And uh, that looked like an absolute impossibility because in A.D. 70, the nation of Israel was totally devastated by the Roman Titus and the Jews were driven out of the country. And for almost 1,900 years, they did not have a homeland. They were not a nation amongst the nations of the world. And lo and behold, in 1948, Right, in, right as we are approaching the end, they again became a viable nation amongst the nations of the world. Secondly, the Bible pre, uh, prophesied that the, the nation of Israel would remain in unbelief, not accepting Jesus as their Messiah as long as there were any Gentiles still becoming saved. Now, in order to prove that, that meant they not only had to be a nation, but we'd also have to see the evidence that as we approach the end, they are not interested in Christ. And it was very interesting. You know, a lot of preachers, when Israel became a nation, they said, oh, they, they didn't read the Bible correctly. And they said, oh, now they're going to turn to Christ. No way, no way. The Bible says, no, they're going to remain in unbelief, except for a tiny trickle of believers. That basically, they will not accept Christ as their Messiah. And lo and behold, they've been in their own nation now for over 50 years, and there is adamant in their refusal to recognize Christ as their Messiah as they have ever been in their entire history. And again, that prophecy was literally and perfectly fulfilled as it has been given in the Word of God. And there's no, there's no book, no book that is as precise and accurate in, in these kind of things. And, and that's just one of the uh, reasons why we know that it is the Word of God. And, and uh, more than that, as we trust in the Bible and we see God working in our lives and uh, relate that uh, as a child of God, to what God has told us what would happen. Again, we, we are encouraged all the time. Ah, uh, yes, the Bible is absolutely trustworthy. Now, I can only say this. There's no advantage in just thinking about the Bible. There's no advantage in just uh, 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 discussing the Bible. What the Bible says, faith, and faith has to do with salvation. And that is the bottom line that everyone should be concerned about because if we're not saved, it's guaranteed that we're going to spend eternity in hell. The Bible is, uh, repeats this in uh, many, many, many different ways. And, and God always carries out what he has declared that would happen. And that is going to happen. And the only way that we can... Uh, be in a place where God can save us if that is his 
if that is his plan to do so. And we don't really know whether it's his plan to save any person, uh, any particular person, uh, but we can always have that hope. And God says, faith, that is salvation, comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so you really want to get into the Bible and start reading it carefully, carefully. And pray, begin to pray for some understanding. Begin to pray that you might be faithful to what God is telling you to do. And begin to beseech the Lord, oh Lord, I begin to see that this Bible has some ugly things to say about the future of mankind. And I know I'm in trouble. Have mercy, have mercy, have mercy on me. And then wait upon the Lord. Maybe, maybe God might save you too. So, um, in summary, you're, what you're saying is that because of the accuracies of, of the prophecies of the Bible, that, that really is what sort of well, that's one demonstrates of, its truth. Well, that's one. Uh, the, is the, uh, it's absolutely accurate, but it's also in just the very content of the Bible and how it is written and, and how, it's, uh, how consistent it is. It's, it was prepared over a period of 1,500 years uh, by uh, various scribes wrote down what God gave to them. And, and uh, yet when we really study the Bible carefully, we find there, while there are many apparent contradictions, there really are no contradictions. Everything finally harmonizes together. And no human beings could write a book uh, over a period of 1,500 years and have the consistency of the way the Bible is. It's the, uh, ever, the more we spend time in the Bible, the more we just marvel at how wonderful it is and that only God could have written it. Uh-huh. Okay, can I bother you with one one more thing? Um, you you talk about apparent contradictions and and that not really being the case. Can you give me an example of uh, of one of those? Like what what appeared to have been a contradiction, but and then how you how it revealed well, itself the, not being well, the, such. Yeah, you know, for example, in one place it says, "If you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved." And yet, as we search the Bible, we know that, no, nobody can, uh, or if you repent of your sins, you will become saved. And yet, the Bible says in another place, no, you're spiritually dead. So it looks like a contradiction. And then, finally, when we get all the information together, and that's the role of a, of a Bible teacher and, and uh, those who are getting people into the Word is to is to tie this all together. We find there really is no contradiction. It means that if you if you uh, repent of your sins because God has given you a new heart or a new soul, and that has to do with becoming saved. And and when we when we tie all of those verses together, we find there is no contradiction at all. Uh, and uh, and uh, the, 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 that's that's just one amongst many. Uh, God wrote the Bible in a way so that it is very easy to believe you have a contradiction here or there. For example, in one place it tells us that a king was uh, eight years old when he began to reign. In another place it says. The same king was 18 years old when he began to reign. And anybody who just reads that uh, and says, well, then obviously we can't trust the Bible. But when we finally search this out in the Bible, we find, yeah, they're both true. He began to reign as a co-regent with his father when he was eight years old. And he began to reign alone when his father died, when he was 18 years old, and the context uh, will only uh, will show us uh, how we are to understand that there is no contradiction. It just means that we have to be more careful about how we're understanding this language, and that's just another kind of uh, verse that. Uh, sometimes it's used to indicate we can't trust the Bible. I have studied the Bible for years and years and years, and frankly, 
there are no contradictions. The verses that appear to be contradictory are the verses that frequently have some of the most beautiful truths within them. But I'll tell you, we, God keeps us very humble. And we can look at a verse for a long time and not understand it. We, but the question is, are we going to trust it? Is it the Word of God? And again and again, finally, maybe months or even years later, as I work again on that particular passage, I see, ah, now I see it. I see how it all fits together with some other things in the Bible, and there is no contradiction at all. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, good evening, Mr. Camping. Thank you so much for taking my call. Yeah, turn um, your radio have... off. Turn your yes. radio off, please. Yes, I did. Thank you. Yes. I apologize. I was right. I didn't. I didn't anticipate getting getting uh, answers so quickly. Um, I just have one question. I have a million questions, but for now, I'll just ask you one. Um, I embrace very, very deeply the teachings of Family Radio. I just have a question about people who call this, themselves Christians. Um, based on saying, for example, the sinner's prayer. And I guess my question to you is, is it not possible that some of the people who, let's say, do say the sinner's prayer or who believe that they've received Jesus, and, I, and I've listened to the verses of Scripture that you have given uh, regularly that, you know, dispute that that is not the way, one per, that, the way a person becomes saved, and I understand that. But I'm just wondering, in the multitude of, of people who supposedly love the Lord and are distributing tracts, and, um, and every word is, you know, Jesus, Jesus, and they're, they're, it's, it's just so difficult for me to believe that not one of those individuals is a saved individual. So that's my question to you. Well, I can't know the heart of anyone, but I can tell you this. Yes. All right, that those individuals are in an enormously dangerous situation because God warns. Think, for example, of the man in Numbers 15 who picked up a few sticks on the Sabbath day. Now, most theologians or preachers have no idea what God is talking about there. Remember, Christ spoke in parables. And uh, when we understand that to do any work on the Sabbath day was like trusting in, in some kind of uh, assist we had or we offered in getting ourselves saved. And God told Moses in Numbers 15, that this man who picked up a few sticks, it was as incidental uh, a work on the Sabbath that you could ever imagine. It was, it, it, it was almost nothing, almost nothing. And yet God specifically told Moses, stone him to death. In other words, he would be a picture of someone who is saying, oh, God did all the work to save me, but I know that it really happened only because I prayed the sinner's prayer or I did this or I did that. It's like a man who picked up a few sticks. Well, now, I'm not, I'm, uh, I, 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 if I were in those shoes, I would say, wow, I'm in deep trouble. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I recognize I can't trust anything that I have done. And, and, uh, and not a bit can I trust that. And, and as a matter of fact, those who, uh, who just glibly and f are, are go along with this, their, their trust is really not in the Bible. Their trust is in what their church is teaching. Their trust is in their pastor. Their trust is in their creed. Their trust is not in the Bible. And the proof of this is these individuals, when you come to them, with the whole Bible and say, look, look what we're learning from the Bible. They will say, well, we don't really have any interest in that. We are safe and secure. Uh, we uh, we uh, uh, don't have to be concerned about the timeline of history or anything. Well, 
uh, that they're showing that they are that they don't that they're not living as a Christian because the nature of a child of God is that he delights in the Word of God. He feeds on the Word of God. He wants to know all that he can, uh, and he wants to be corrected if there's anything he's teaching being he's a, he's a holding that is incorrect. And so, I I can't think of a. Uh, any more dangerous position than to be in that situation. Now, I admit that through the history of the church, uh, throughout the church age, uh, these wrong doctrines uh, very heavily have been in view. I also know from the Bible that God did not expect that there would be a great harvest of people coming into the body of believers throughout the church age. That can be shown from the Bible, that that God never did expect that. But also, it's possible that just because the Bible, uh, that person was reading the Bible, even though uh, he didn't understand salvation, he didn't understand, and he'd been been, uh, the preacher was telling him wrong things, and so on, Yet God could work right through the reading of the word and save that person, uh, although that person uh, uh, would uh, uh, never really came to very much of an understanding of why God saved him. But uh, I I think it is the most dangerous place to be if if I have been trusting at all in my. Uh, free will salvation or the fact that my water baptism has brought me into the covenant in some way as many reformed churches teach uh, or whatever I would be frightened out of my skin oh Lord have mercy I've got a wrong gospel somehow I, I must realize that you have to do all the work and and uh, I have to wait upon you and oh Lord help me to want to do your will more and more. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Campy? Yes. I'm not uh, very good on the Bible, but uh, somewhere in the New Testament, the apostles are asking God or Jesus, when will this time come? And he and the one of the apostles or Jesus says, they no one, no one will know the time or the season or anything else. So I'm asking, where do you get that you can tell? when the time will come. Well, first of all, it is true until our day. God has, uh, until our generation, and the church world has been going on for 19, more than 1900 years, God has not opened the eyes of any true believers or any false believers to the truth of time that we God has kept that veiled he's kept that hidden altogether but uh, and and uh, and uh, throughout the ch- uh, ch- uh, church age uh, we w- the best we could say is we don't know when Christ will come again that's what we, I'm we, talking about yes all right but 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 now as we continue to read the Bible, we find that when we get near the time of the end, it is God's plan to open up a whole lot of revelation from the Bible, a lot of reveal many truths that he has hidden before. But and I, that, don't think, that's the t- I don't think that, that God has changed the Bible from the time that he first it, wrote it, the it, Bible. It has not been changed at all. Let me use an illustration. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians, a mystery has been revealed to me that the gospel is to go to the Gentiles. Now, when we read the Bible, we find that all through the Old Testament, God has declared that the gospel would go to all the nations. Abraham was called Abraham because he would be the father of a multitude, the spiritual father of a multitude of nations. And yet, 
all through the Old Testament that was never, never understood because true understanding of what God is teaching in the Bible only comes as God opens our spiritual eyes. And it was not God's purpose throughout the Old Testament era to open any of the true believers' spiritual eyes to the fact that uh, even though he has declared it, they did not understand that the gospel was to go to all the world. And in Paul's day, Peter's day, that mystery was revealed. Now, by the same token, all the information about today and the timing of the end in all of this has always been in the Bible, but God has kept it sealed. But now in our day, he has is opening our spiritual eyes, and we we learn a whole lot of things. And God sums it up probably as well as any place in the Bible, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, there God says, there God says in verse 2, verse 2, for yourselves, no, this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 2, this is, these words are right from God's mouth, for yourselves know perfectly, that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. And that is what has been taught uh, and what the church has understood, and that's all they could learn uh, throughout the church age. And that is presently what is being hung on to by all the local congregations. Christ is coming as a thief in the night. And he goes on, For when they shall say peace and safety, sudden Then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. And so uh, they are confident, we're saved, everything is well, we don't have to worry about uh, trying to find any more information. But now, listen to the next verse. This is still God speaking here. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch. In other words, God is saying, but wait a minute. There are those who are watching, and Christ will not come as a thief in the night for them. That's why he said in Revelation chapter 3, verse 3, as he speaks about the same subject, in the last part of verse 3, of Revelation 3, he declares, he declares, If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come upon thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon you. Now how do we watch? By searching the Bible. Now we can understand why as God is talking about our day in the book of Amos, for example, he says something that before we wouldn't have understood at all until our day. But there he says in the, in the, uh, in the uh, book of Amos in chapter 8, or no, chapter 3, Amos chapter 3, he says in verse 7, Surely... The Lord, the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. The lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord God hath spoken, who can but prophesy, publish in the palaces, and so on. Uh, in other words, when God is ready to bring judgment, he expects the true believers to know a whole lot about it so that they can faithfully declare to the world what is really going on. So we don't want to want to think for a moment. We just have to sit here and think, well, we can't know anything about it. Christ is coming as a thief in the night. That is for those who are not watching, who are not interested in, keep lear- in keeping uh, on learning from the Word of God. But with that, I have to say good night, because we've come to the end of our time. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night.